<clears throat> hey everybody uh we'll we'll uh give people some time to enter the chat i'm actually streaming from my youtube channel today which i haven't done in a long time so probably three years <laughs> <laughs> nice so we'll see if anybody else comes on but i know that uh <laughs> that channel is monetized so i figure we might get some more engagement <laughs> by turning that thing on so uh, <laughs> but uh yeah so we wanted to do this because we saw that there's a video by the guy a guy by the name of warren smith and warren smith was talking about basically the union rules and how that affects operations and creativity and new IP in Hollywood and basically how it's unsustainable. Um, and so we're going to actually play that video and walk people. Oops. Your meat, your mic went mute. That's going to happen a bunch of times because I'm having some sort of weird glitch. Yeah, weird cable problem. Hopefully it doesn't happen yet. Are you there? I am there, yeah. All right. All right. Hopefully it doesn't happen that much. <laughs> but uh i think i need to replace that usb cable or so all right you know i need to get a mac for my yeah. main desktop because this is it's just that, a nightmare i agree <laughs> the, the uh the mac mini is an yeah. amazing it's incredible yeah <clears throat> i'm definitely planning on getting one soon or at least getting a dock for my laptop so i can make that my everyday uh because just i built this computer on my own like when I got married, so that's six <laughs> years now. <laughs> that's a long time for a computer, right? It, yeah. It's not slow at all. It's just buggy. And so, but anyway, all right. So let, let, let's go. Well, Jason, you, well, first, we'll start, like you have experience working in union writers rooms, right? Uh, not working in them, but working with union writers and dealing with unions in production. So, so not from the writer side, from the like? producer side. Well, your initial initially <laughs> well the the so first off you have to get a certain number of credits before you can then join the union and then uh it you basically agree to uh sort of stay in your lane and only do the things that the union says you can do and and such and so um you know and the, there are certain things that they're really helpful with. You know, they you have objective uh, ob objective rates. You know th um, that you can use in negotiation. You've got all sorts of things like that that are really helpful. So that they when they were designed, it was so that the artists could worry about the arts and not have to worry so much about the business side. The problem is when you start gathering power, people that like power start gathering into those positions. And that's what ended up happening with a lot of the unions. Um, and so the, so you end up having uh, from the writer's side, you know, you've got, you're in a particular phase of the, of your career or of the union or of your credit strike, you know, the credits that you have. And then that, that gets you a particular paycheck. Um, and then they take care of your, you know, your health insurance and stuff like that in the midst of it. What has happened though <coughs> is uh, the, the, the newest union rules rewrite or union agreement rewrite has um, said the, the old agreement with television worked really well in television. And we want you to do the same sort of thing with some, tweaks to streaming we want the same kind of structure and agreement and in, um, in streaming and but streaming is monetized in a different way it's functions in a different way the business side is not the same as uh as television and so it's really caused a bunch of struggles and problems um you know and 
people are starting to say, hey, this union is has is not helping us anymore because of, of this. Now, I think it also got voted in by majority. I, I think that it was a a big part of it just had to do with like the general ignorance of how business runs and how math works and things like that. <laughs> so that's, that's uh, how you get minimum wage laws, right? So. <laughs> right. Well, I, I, cause I, I uh, saw the new union deal and pulled it and was reading it and was like, Oh, this is going to be a disaster, but it's because I've worked on the production side too. And I have basic, uh, facility with a calculator. <laughs> so I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is going to destroy, uh, it's going to destroy a lot of productions, which is what's happened, right? You know, they just started cutting productions, cutting th- things that weren't greenlit or that hadn't started filming already. <laughs> well, I was, uh, I was, uh, I saw a post on Reddit from someone who said that uh they were in a like a grocery store um in new york city and they replaced the cashier with a telecashier in the philippines at a three dollar minimum wage uh and so it's just it's just a computer monitor with a lady sitting there and she's doing all the overseeing all the checkout because of the minimum wage laws are so high um and I, I, and so like the film industry has kind of positioned themselves into that same hole where it's like we can't get new talent that's paid what new talent should get paid um and so there's at this point like literally no risk is available and we'll get into that in the video so let's go ahead and start that this is by a guy named warren smith by the way and this was going around twitter yesterday and uh we got the lore account got tagged in it is going to implode today we're going to talk about why hollywood is going to implode according to the logic and the numbers because numbers do not lie so looking at this from an economics perspective it is going to happen it's not sustainable so i'm going to write a show based on the new agreement from the writer's strike the agreements in place if i'm going to write the show myself i don't have to then bring in the mandated amount if I were to bring you in, it's not- okay, Jason. Feel free to talk and it, like okay. just tell me to stop at any time. Something you want to want to hit on? Yeah, not just me now. So now we have to adhere to this. So now we have to bring in a minimum of five writers. So he, for he, the weeks. minimum of five has to do with the number of episodes per season. So if you hit, if you have more than six episodes a season, then you have to have you by union rules. If you're a union show, you have to bring in five writers to write those six episodes. Uh, seven episodes have to have five. Right. Seven episodes have to have five, but usually you've already got the pilot written. Right. So you've uh, got six more episodes to make a seven episode season and uh, up to 12. And so you have to have a minimum of five writers for those next six episodes. Or, yeah, or most shows are at least season. eight episodes nowadays, right? So yeah, yeah, eight to I mean, ten. But you can see the math; that's about to change. Everything's going to suddenly be a six episode season. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Okay, all right. Let's keep going. At fourteen thousand dollars, a little over fourteen thousand dollars a week. Three of those five have to be writer producers at that rate. The others can be 7,000, a little bit under 7,000. There's three tiers, but we're gonna keep it simple. If you and I decide, oh, this should be over 13 episodes, we have to get six people. You and I can't do it. According to these rules, we're not allowed to do it. This is going to drive up costs. It has driven it up to the point where, okay, the five rules of economics is going to show throughout the course of this video why Hollywood is imploding television, episodic, and feature films. Yes, it's woke messaging, political messaging, the debate around feminism, Barbie, all of that, but this is really the heart of it, the numbers. This is not opinion. These are the laws of economics. All right, let's stop there. 
basically what he's saying is you have a set amount of writers you have to have. And then of those set amount of writers, some of them have to get paid 14,000 a week and the rest minimum 7,000 a week. So you're already with five writers paying what that was at 14, 28, like you're, you're, you're near like 30, 40, yeah, near 40,000. 36, 36, 42. Yeah. You're yeah, somewhere 42, around 50, 50 grand a week at that point. Just for writers. This is per week, right. not well, per the, episode. And it's a minimum of 10 weeks that you have to give them to write. So the, uh, that's so, a half so, million for the writer's room out the gate before. No. Yeah. Yeah. So before <laughs> you, before you d have done anything, right. It's you, you know, minimum a TV show now is a half million for writers and it's going to be union. So, um, that, uh, the and so and so this is a really good example of why fascism pushes you pushes everybody into two categories the at, uber wealthy and the poor right this is what fascism always does when you start dictating spending for some other reason than profit right yeah, for well, some other the, reason I'll, than I'll tell you right to now I'll, I'll tell you right now if i had the money for a union production and I know that I have to spend a half a million dollars on writers, like bare minimum. That's bare minimum too. Cause uh, some writers, you know, if I get Vince Gilligan, <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm not paying 14,000 a week. I, no, and right? you shouldn't, so, right. You should, he should, you know. he should, he should, he's, he's, earned it. he's, he's earned worth it. a lot more. Yeah. yeah. But, but, but that's what I'm saying. Like, so, so, but, but I'm just saying like, I just, I'm just going to go for like the, the people at the bare minimum I can half a million dollars right up front for writing. I, I've immediately lost any sort of ability for financial risk. Right. Yeah. You, you, at this point, you're not making anything that doesn't have already an established, you know, here's, here's the audience that I know I can go get. Right. So you're not building anything new. You're not trying anything yeah. out. And um, they, they just basically eliminated any sort of independent film. Because it used to be the independent independent films were like two hundred and fifty five hundred k, like that was the price for standard independent films, and then went you know about three five million around that range, but like now you just took a big chunk out of that and you moved there. There's no such thing as low budget films anymore. No, there's well, there's yeah, there's no such thing as that as the micro budget. But see, this is so the first thing that my wife and I did was Google right to work states. <laughs> <laughs> when we started talking about this, we said, wait, so where can we film that's <laughs> that doesn't have these rules? Well, I mean, a right to work state um, that doesn't that allows you to work outside of the union um, without punishment, you know, without punishment. You can work outside of the union, but you can be uh, you can be uh, um, you you don't have the freedom to guarantee that you won't be harassed. <laughs> so <laughs> that's just, that's the, the, the weird part about that's it. That's the way unions work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, and like my, my dad was a, he was a union contractor for years. You know, I, I, I think this is, this is um, as much an example of the bad education system for the last generation or two um catching up to the people making the union rules as it is with the union systems in and of themselves I, you know i don't think if this is not automatically caused by the fact of a unionization this is caused by people at the top that are either greedy or they're playing on the greed of people um or they just don't know how economics and math works because i saw that victor over in the comments said Everybody was saying, well, they've got so many millions and millions of dollars um, that, you know, we're just we're just cutting out a little piece. Um, but the problem is the margins are already I mean, the margins are thin. I, I mean, I know it's you're working with millions of dollars, but the margins are thin. One in five movies um, is makes more than they spent. Right. So you've so it's not like um, it's it's not like you. 
you, you every movie brings in so much money that you know yeah. it's that it, most movies still lose money um I, and then the ones that do well make up for the loss uh, you you're dealing with it's a, it's a margin issue in economics right i watched a really good video on tiktok of a guy that just took over a subway franchise and it was like how much money did i make my first week of owning a subway franchise and he went through all the costs and like at the end of it he like in one week he only made 700 bucks and he said he said that's not a lot of money because i work 13 hours a day right so you know, like everybody thinks, oh, yeah, these guys have millions and millions of dollars. And and even in that, this the week, you know, he had to give Subway like 20 percent of all his gro- all he grossed. Right. So so like even Subway, like that wasn't a lot that Subway made. It wasn't millions and millions of dollars. I think Subway took home maybe 200 bucks or so, um, you know. So so, it's, you know, when you, when you look at that, you go, yeah, you know, this is a this is a numbers game. There's also in a debate online where these guys were saying that all oh, the CEO of Mc, uh, Burger King makes $54,000 an hour. And, you know, he's just, you know, that's what, how much money is that? You know, it's so much money. They should give that to everybody else. Well, if you look like Burger King has 35,000 employees. So if you were to take his salary away, you'd only give people two more dollars an hour <laughs> at that point. And then you wouldn't have a CEO that was worth, you know, that would, that'd be worth anything because not everybody can be the CEO of Burger King. Um, so, but anyway, I just, uh, anyway, anyway, so I, I just think you're, you're right. I think it's a, an economics issue, um, uh, economic understanding and uh, uh, punish the rich sort of mentality. Supply and demand. Yeah. What happens when we drive up the cost? That means less jobs. The only way unions can do this, Milton Friedman said this as well. The only way that this can be achieved is to decrease the number of jobs. That's not their incentive. Their incentive is to get the agreement, to get these numbers as high as possible. But the result is that there's actually fewer jobs. It inflates the cost of production, less chances are gonna be taken, and it causes a full out depression. And there's just an article was just published discussing this, it's full blown, people are panicking. And, if, and it's gonna get worse, mark my words. And it's not an opinion. Like, does this make sense? The more scarce something is, the more I'm willing to pay for it. Well, there's the opposite of scarcity. There's too many writers now. They're fighting for jobs. And as we see as a result of that model, the cost of production has been driven up so high that as a producer, I can't afford that. Wasn't that one of the points of the writers too, that if you were hired as a writer on a network television show that runs from what September to May that um, <clears throat> they had the the security of that job for 10 weeks no no, no I mean before on a network where um, they would um, they would be on set during production and see how the character evolves and make changes to the script and so on and so forth. As a producer, the last thing you want during production is the writer to be making changes or coming up to the director and trying yeah, to suggest changes. Yeah, but that was the model changes. before, I understand. Well, that's the model now. That was their point, is that they, they tried to build that, they did build that into the agreement, where three people within that five that are mandated have to be writer-producers who are then on set and their justification is, oh, an actor needs a line rewritten mid-shoot. They need to come over to the three of us. And so let maybe us I'm not understanding them. it correctly. I, I, from what I understood and following very briefly the strike, one of their complaints was that rather than being hired for, let's say, 40 weeks on average, that term has been gradually reduced the time of their employment on a specific TV show. The problem is that based on economics, there cannot be a set mandate for that. It's going to vary from project to project based on what the project necessitates. So yeah, there might be some cases where we need to just bring in a writer for a week to fix this up before we move into production or bring them in midstream. Or maybe you do need to bring them in for, in production. The problem is, is we can't make those specific hiring choices now. It's either this one model crammed upon us or nothing, or you're not allowed so to play the game. So what 
that what's going to happen is we're going to get a return to a studio system. Um, you're going to get, because it's the only way to really get around the way these writers rules work in any sort of, uh, isn't that what Adam Sandler does? It is. Yeah. And, yeah. and he's, he, he's doing it because he's out ahead of the game and has realized that I don't have to worry about this stuff. If I, if I have all of my people on salary, right. Right. They work for the studio on salary and what do they do? Well, they write or they direct or whatever it is. You know, they do, they, um, and you don't have to, uh, each, each particular movie doesn't have to become its own company. But, but with that happening, you basically thin, uh, and what, I mean, how that worked is that that caused it to be thinned down to just a handful, just a small handful of companies um, that were that were well, working that, that's how, everything. That's how Hollywood started as a rejection right. of the studio system. They moved out west and and started Hollywood because of the monopoly of the studio system. <laughs> exactly. I think is it is it the documentary on Paramount that talks about that too? I think uh, or one of the things that came out. But but yeah. So so Hollywood was started as a punk rock revolution, really. To, to revolt against the studio system. Studio system took it to court. Um, and then uh, they lost. Uh, and that's where United Artists and all those other organizations came from uh, that were fighting against the studios and trying to make a more artist-driven Hollywood system. And uh, that's how we got the great Hollywood movies and built the economy that we did. Um, and now we're reverting back to that. And uh, that that's a problem. I, I, I do think it's interesting to mention here on the on the video, he he mentioned uh, that one, like you can't like if there was uh, if you needed a rewrite of the script that has to go through the writers. And so the writers have to be on set to make those changes. So so the the lighting guy can't go, you know, I think that would actually be a better line. <laughs> which is which is really how you like that just shields you from like creative input and you know in companies they always say uh uh even the janitor has an opinion on how this place runs right like you know you, you go to a company and they go i i you know the ceo meets with the janitors and like everything uh but you can't do that on the set now the union right. won't let you, the lighting guys can't touch the costumes right like so like everything's separate every like it's what a nightmare that is to funk like you can't run a bit you can't run any business that way you like like if, if i had a like like if if i were to ask one of our employees hey can you uh uh the marketing guy's busy but you got photoshop skills can you just pull up make a little quick design in photoshop for our facebook uh and he was like no that's not my job <laughs> I'm not allowed to do that. Uh, that would be, that'd be all, what an awful environment that would be. And you don't have a team then. Um, yeah. Because I, I, I think what this ends up doing is it creates a, it ends up creating rivalries and a, and a fear based system. And it's really hard to be consistently creative in a fear based system. Right. Um, you know, the, the, and uh, that's, just one of those things that you see in history that sit situations like this, you start seeing the drop off of quality and you start getting a factory mindset for what gets put out. And, you know, disco, I think is a good example when, where you have a factory mindset for the music and you just had a bunch of musicians that were, would pass along um, you know, okay, we're going to do a drum part. We're going to do a bass part. And then uh, it would come together and you would get somebody that hands, hands you a factory produced disco song. And every once in a while you had a good disco song get produced, but that factory mentality, when it comes to art, it, it is a, has a dehumanizing effect on the art. It's also what led to the punk rock and the hip hop revolution, right? That, that, the you listen to old punk rock records and they would shout like oi 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 down with disco <laughs> and you had this punk rock revolution that comes out of 
what they call the plastic uh, a, a revolt against the plastic culture, the factory culture, you know, that, the, that's that sort of thing. And that's, I mean, we see that happening in Hollywood. You see this, you know, you, you see what happened, the difference between when Pixar launched and it had artistic freedom mm-hmm. and what Pixar produces in, inside the Disney studio system. Mm-hmm. You, the it's not the a lot of the people are the same people but the system um it punishes creativity you know know, factory system punishes creativity that's probably one of the greatest examples i think because you you just had this in-house artists where everybody was sleeping on the floor and they were just trying to make a good movie and they'd made 10 of them in a row (laughs) right and then Disney bought them and then it just went all to garbage. Um, and, you know, like the, it's, it's, it couldn't be more clear what the problem is in that situation. Same thing with the Muppets, right? Same thing when you had, you know, Jim Henson's Creature Shop and those were the guys that were really running that play. And then, you know, Jim Henson didn't want to sell it to Disney. Uh, and then eventually Disney got it after he died. And then now they don't even know what to do with the Muppets. Um, So just you see these IPs just get destroyed um, because the studio doesn't understand them um, at the level as, you know, the guy who actually voices the Muppets and knows the character does. Right. Yeah. So, but he's got it. The the guy who does the Muppet, like the guy who plays Elmo has to be on union with the writers in order to make any changes Right. to what Elmo says on screen like that doesn't make any sense like it doesn't make any sense um so so uh I wonder anyway. how guys like Ryan Reynolds get away with that I just I'm just curious I don't know I don't actually know the answer but he's constantly you know making up new lines on set as he goes maybe the actors get to do that but uh Postmill highlights points out that Lucas films started out that way which is true with that yeah. um and then uh Victor talks about how the Japanese, um, they have the combination of the division of labor and the cross training. What's interesting is the early Pixar was based um, partly on the Japanese system because they those guys that were um, coming out of, uh, was it Caltech? Uh, Cal Arts, they're coming out of Cal Arts. They had all studied um, that Japanese system and the there's a reason that Pixar then was the first uh, distribution point for Miyazaki. And, you know, they, they were the yeah. ones that brought a lot of that, the great Japanese art to uh, the United States. And they, you know, they were, they were the ones that said, Oh my gosh, you guys got to see this. This stuff's great. But they were basing a lot of their system uh, you know, in cre- creativity Inc about Pixar. They talk about the, uh, feedback rooms that they would develop where everybody would come and everybody would give feedback. Um, you know, and then it was the director, his job to sort through the feedback, but they purposefully built a, everybody gives feedback culture. Um, and Victor points out that's why Godzilla minus one, which was brilliant. It was an amazing movie costs so much less. Um, then the new Godzilla versus or Godzilla X <laughs> Kong, which I thoroughly enjoyed, but not because it was a good movie. <laughs> I enjoyed it because my son and I went and heckled um, and <laughs> we laughed so <laughs> much. I really enjoy. I mean, it, it was a it was a, a return to the B movie God version of Godzilla, but without the budgets like it was an incredibly expensive <laughs> b movie <laughs> yeah. but it, it it delivered uh all of the um godzilla sequel glory of oh my gosh really that you're not going to explain how hey we've got to get across the country um let's get back over there and it's takes you like six minutes to move from <laughs> japan to Africa, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you finish. You start your conversation on one continent and walk in the room and finish it <laughs> in another continent. It was amazing. I, it was yeah. incredibly B level. <laughs> um, so yeah. Side note: that reminds me of a 
24. They had a role in, in the show 24 that there was uh, never any traffic. Uh, and, and, they, and, and, it, and it was just, it was always just assumed that LA had no traffic in the world of 24 because, <laughs> because they would have to go so many places and they said they just couldn't write for traffic. Um, and so anyway, uh, but <laughs> so anyway, let's continue with the Warrens try to get through this. Yeah. And yeah, you don't honestly, I, I would not want, I don't think the writers need to logically be sitting on set trying to rewrite lines. It's, it seems that from my experience that ha would be between the director and the actor. So, yeah. So then, so then you're saying that the writer completed their job the moment they put their pen down. I think that should be, in some cases, yeah, if, the pro if that's the type of scenario and if, if that's the type of project, in some cases, you hire the writer to write. If you want to hire the writer to, to be more than that, that's fine. The problem is, is this, this removes the freedom to make that decision. What are the impacts of that upon the creative process? So like the five basic economic principles, scarcity, supply and demand, marginal costs, marginal benefits and incentives. Well, incentives, we're just removing that because there's no natural incentive here. It's being mandated. So let's throw that out the window. Scarcity, well, this is actually the opposite of scarcity. We have too much, too many people looking for jobs. Supply and demand, we talked about that, where you increase the cost of the product, <laughs> it's going to make less opportunities for those jobs, like increasing the cost of hiring the writers. Marginal costs. Right? And marginal benefits. Mar every time you create a unit, how much does that unit cost? It'd be marginal costs. Well, that's driving up to, to hire that writer. <laughs> like you were saying, there's, it's not allowing marginal costs to, to naturally occur and marginal benefits. So now we have to bring those three writer producers, even though we, don't, we might not need them. We might not need six writers if we're going above that other number. And so we're just. <laughs> Every single one of the five core economic principles are just being thrown out of the window. So if you don't, so, how could this possibly be sustainable? In, in the year 2000, there were more professional NBA players than television screenwriters. That's there, there, and that is after the, that, that's, you know, after the cable revolution, after, I mean, you think, before cable, there were so few t professional television writers that it was a tiny little group and everybody knew everyone. And, you know, they went to each other's kids bar mitzvahs and, and, you know, baptisms and like, it was just such a tiny group of people. Well, um, streaming came along and it exploded. Um, I believe at its height, it quadrupled the number of television writers uh, that there were available. The, but that was already trending down. The, the number of, the total number was already trending down. And if I was a cynical person, I would say that this union uh, contract, one of the things it did was just cut out all of the bad writers not not bad writers but young inexperienced writers maybe is a better way to put it right where yeah. you've got all these older writers that say hey i don't want these young people gunning for my job anymore well let's write a contract that gets rid of all the young writers right an entire generation of young writers is just going to be non-existent um because there's no spot for them um i mean but you're you're having a similar problem in like and I would say that I this may actually cause the quality of television to go up <laughs> because there's going to be a lot fewer shows made and only the very best, most experienced writers are going to have work. So, and I mean, if you watched many of the new uh, MCU TV shows, the number of times I thought, what 
how did they let this writing through? What, how, you know, where was, where was somebody that was like, you know, this isn't very good, right? Because where, why was there nobody in the room to say, um, uh, and, and, you know, you hear about like Google, um, everybody being afraid to criticize uh, anyone, everybody being afraid that, that uh, the younger people are going to freak out on them and, you know, take them to HR if they criticize them or make mm-hmm. them feel unsafe because they, you know, said, "Hey, your 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 math is wrong in this Excel spreadsheet," and you know, um, you're going to get accused of making an unsafe work environment. You, know, you hear those sorts of stories, and then I look at this union contract and think, "Are they solving the uh, problem of young woke writers here?" <laughs> <laughs> is that what's going yeah. on? <laughs> yeah. So, we, but it's going to be a lot fewer shows. The shows are going to be a lot more expensive. You're only going to get those shows that are up in the, you know, high, um, the the high tens of millions. Yeah, but which I would say, the that creates a market though, because there's going to be more demand for content than is what's put, which I think we're seeing now. People yeah. are like, I have to pay 20 bucks a month for Netflix and it's less content they're putting out now. Like they're already saying And I have to have and I have to have commercials. <laughs> commercials and you can't password share, right? So it's just <laughs> <laughs> it's just worse, fun, worse, fun, worse. So so no, I no, I, I I get that. And uh so I, I can see how it could make things better be, that's just that's just a uh there's no risk. Uh, that can be taken, yeah. right? So, so you're going to get a lot less bad content, and the only yeah. the good stuff is going to be put before you, which I think is going to it's going to work out the woke stuff, but it doesn't yeah. solve any problems. Um, well, because think it, of the shows that wouldn't get made right now, right? Stranger Things would not get made. It couldn't get made under this union contract because the uh, you would just had the two writers, right? right? And that's uh, Breaking Bad wouldn't get made under this current contract because it's too much of a risk. Mm-hmm. You, I mean, yeah, you're, and it you're took, not, you... yeah. Well, breaking bad, like it was, nobody was watching it for the first three years, right? Like it didn't gain a following into the first three years. And a lot of that was because of streaming. Uh, but then it became for the last three seasons of it, like it became huge and they had uh, better call Saul, of course, which, was huge as well. So, 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 but, but yeah, like, like a Vince Gilligan show would not have gotten funded uh, prior with, with, with the, with, with these new union rules. And, and, and I think like the, the thing is like, there's a lot of other stuff too, like, you know, like adult swim or a lot of the underground infrastructure that built what we have, like MTV, uh, you know, uh, so, so, so you have all these things that were insanely experimental food network, like, like, like that was insane. They, they, you know, they had all the same chefs using the same kitchen. They didn't have enough refrigerator space and meat was spoiling. And like, like that's how these networks got built. Um, but it was just on risk and creativity. They prior, they prior, they prioritized the creativity and the freedom that cable brought them, uh, that and 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 not the financial risk, and because of that, they all be- got fi- insanely financially successful um, and billion dollar brands. Uh, and- Lost your microphone again. What he's saying, but we can't hear him is something along the lines of the risk created new intellectual properties that ended up with a lot of value over the long run, but couldn't have been made in this, in this uh, atmosphere. I'm assuming, I'm assuming did I, did I get it right? <laughs> yeah, I still can't hear you. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe push play on the video and uh, see if you can. Oh, there you are. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so, uh, but yeah, but yeah, but yeah. So, so just like the, 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 the ability to, for the, to have the creative risk, um, is, was what really built those things. But when you, uh, 
when you don't have that creative risk, you're, you're, you, you have to prioritize the financial risk. Um, or yeah. when, you have, when you have the financial risk, you can't have the creative risk, right? So that, that creates this dilemma uh, that we have. Yeah, let's, let's finish. Uh, the yeah. Hey, James is not even James factoring is a good in. Question too. Yeah, we'll get to that. Uh, the lazy yeah. storytelling reverting to pre-established IP sequels, more superhero movies, because they know they can bank on that because now the cost is so high, they can't make artistic gambles. So therefore they have to bank on what, on remakes that they already, so now what's the result of that? Well, we saw it at the Oscars this year. It was really one movie sweeping everything. Those who are already getting paid allows them to make more. So the people that that top 20% were already the top 20% that were making the most in the entire union. Right. Yeah. So what everyone on that picket line did inevitably, is they allowed those that were already getting paid the most within that bracket to make more, and everyone that was getting paid less is now making less. Fascism. And they were out there picketing for this without even... <laughs> what did you say? Fascism. This is what happens every <laughs> time that we go for fascism. <laughs> you know, I remember... As an economic system over against capitalism. I remember when I worked at a cigar lounge, a guy wanted to work for us that was uh, had cerebral palsy. So there was one job he couldn't do, technically, uh, which was climb up ladders to get the cigars. So the manager was having a real tough time determining whether or not he should hire him because the pay would be the same, but the amount of work he could do would be less. Now, to be fair, we did hire him. And now he's a manager of his own cigar lounge and he didn't give a crap about the rules about whether or not he could safely <laughs> climb up ladders. He ran up ladders on his own cause he's, he was great. Um, but what that did was show how minimum wage laws made it impossible to hire disabled people who could do less because you can't, you have to pay people in accordance with the labor they create. And so if they're create, if they're, if for some reason they create less labor, they, they should get paid less. Um, and, and so like, there's this like problem there. Right. And, uh, he obviously, that guy obviously proved himself and, uh, and OSHA wrong, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, but it just shows how minimum wage forces out disabled people or people who might only be able to give a hundred percent, 50% of the time or something along those lines. Right. Um, and so it, it's actually, demeaning towards uh like you said like it just it just pushes the lower class out so yeah realize okay Hollywood james Beard, reporter, baird's I'm question scared. is really good okay uh he says so why don't people just work outside the unions they haven't up till now is because the reason is because the unions have been able to control distribution or been able to leverage distribution um in their in their favor that is what's going away um, right now, right? The and streaming was uh, making it possible for the it, streaming was threatening. The reason that they went after streaming so hard is because it was threatening the stranglehold they had on distribution. So um, you couldn't get into television, you couldn't get uh, into the theaters, you know, all sorts of places unless you had unions you could um in a lot of places it's near impossible to get tax benefits unless you use unions higher unions um and uh but now with the change in distribution the opening of distribution the broadening now of of uh uh all sorts of other new you know new distribution avenues and um people are at the the film industry is decentralizing and it's moving to non-union states because the union cost is so much that it's offsetting the tax benefits right so when the tax benefits came in they said well okay i if i go you you know union costs an extra 20 percent but i get this 35 percent tax benefit so i still am saving 15 percent well it's not mm. going to be like that anymore and so i think even the um the uh uh even that um tax uh tax incentive system that they've built is getting undercut um 
Yeah, and like Victor says, if you are if you are in the union, you're not allowed to work outside the union. That's part of your agreement with the union is they'll take care of you, but you can't work anywhere else. Well, now look at all these writers saying, "Well, look, I'm in the union, but what's it done for me lately? What's it? How's mm-hmm. it helped me get a job?" How's, right? And so they're going to have to decide between non-union and not working, um, or you know, going and doing something else. Um, and I think. You know, it's it is a brutal time to be a TV writer. It's always kind of been a brutal industry anyway. But you, it's a brutal time to be a TV writer, and I think there's going to be a lot of you know new bank tellers and things that um, is is good. We need bank tellers too. So um, that's right. that's, that's going to happen. It's, uh, <laughs> it, well, it's a hard. Well, I, it, every industry is hard right now. You know, if you're applying for work. Um, and right now in any industry, it's very competitive. Well, they're good. They're they're No, they're going to go to non-union things. If, if the union makes it too hard for them to make an income, they're going to flock towards non-union, whether that's productions or conservative media that goes non-union or uh, YouTube or TikTok. Like they're, they're going to go somewhere be, because, because that's what artists are made to do. And yeah. and I think the like the in, industrious ones for sure, right? Will, for sure. will 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 figure out ways to make a living and make an income, uh, non-union. And I, but I think it's also it's also why it's important to create uh, distribution platforms that don't need to live in that Hollywood ecosystem. Yeah, that live completely outside of it. So and it's a it's a huge opportunity for Christian producers and Christian you know, business owners to act, to show what it means to, you know, ha- have your union boss be Jesus, um, where you don't, you need a union. It if... sounds awful. <laughs> it's, it's almost <laughs> like, you just... <laughs> let me, let me explain. That's what almost blasphemous. <laughs> <laughs> but what I mean is people, the, the reason, uh, the reason that people, are, you know, pay their employees on time now is because they're afraid of the union, afraid of the bo- a boss, the reason they give, right? But if you if you look at Jesus and say, well, you know, I, I answer to Jesus and so I pay people on time. I, I you know, I, I pay, uh, I, I, I pay the agreed upon wage when it's agreed upon. I, you know, I, I take care of my uh, people that work for me. You know, I, um, I keep my word, you know, those sorts of things. I don't promise what I can't deliver. Those sorts of things um, are a huge opportunity. I mean, I, I remember working for, I, w- at one factory uh, where the owner of the factory, he said every once in a while you would have somebody that would come in and, you know, come in and be like, Hey, we're thinking about trying to, Hey, anybody here interested in talking about unionization? And, but, but he was such a good boss um, that the, nobody would ever even consider it. Cause you know, you, if you had a, uh, a baby, you would get a bonus, you know, and you're not allowed to do that in a union setup. I remember one time I, he came out and I was wearing my, uh, church shoes at work on the factory floor because the sole of my shoe had come off and I couldn't afford new shoes till next month. And he came over and he was like, huh, interesting. What's going on? He t- I told him next thing, you know, everybody on the entire floor had bought, he bought new shoes for everyone. Um, Cause he realized, you know, he, he'd walked around and looked at everybody's shoes and said, you know what, if I buy everybody really comfortable shoes to stand all day on my floor, I bet they're going to be more productive. And, you know, he was a Christian. He, he was, he was just taking care of his, his people. I was like, man, this is how you end up with, with, princes you know lords <laughs> you following the battle because you see you know uh, he, his understanding of how to treat people came from the fact that he was a follower of jesus uh and jesus had treated him a certain way it's a huge opportunity when the unions fall apart to show them you know christ likeness uh in these yeah. settings so let's finish this why it's a brutal time to be a tv writer Within that article, I want to get your thought on this. As a show, this is a quote, as a showrunner who is a queer woman of color and I can't get work, that's saying a lot. It's very frustrating. My sexual identity and my race usually make it easier to get a job. <laughs> Logically, that's built into that statement. The icing on this 
is that this was all self-imposed. Is that there, I don't even think, I mean, let's take a look at this clip from Chris Gore, or not Chris Gore, sorry, sorry, Chris, Bob Iger, who tried to warn in the midst of the negotiations that this is going to drastically have some dire effects. This is the worst time in the world to add to that disruption. There's a level of expectation that they have that is just not realistic. And they are adding to a set of challenges that this business is already facing that is, quite frankly, very disruptive. So they're not being realistic? Uh, no, they're not. Why do you think there are so many people who were supporting the strike from Hollywood? Economically, that is the best way to look at motivation. What's right, in an so. individual's financial interest? Well, they were job security. Right, and because then the cost of living that when, when you go in places like LA and New York and you're trying to rent out an apartment, and I mean, you know what the costs are. It's a gig to gig economy. At. It's a very tough game, which is why I'm very honest with students about this. And I try and make it clear that this is by definition a rigged game. So be wise in your decision when you choose what games you want to play. Now that, sh and all of this is not meant to be, I always end the class with this. This is not meant to be discouraging. You talk about distribution and the unions, and it just seems impossible, and it is. It's not meant to be discouraging, it's meant to be liberating. Because What's most, the alternative? Just go do it, don't wait for permission. We make sense of the world <laughs> through stories. So when you're on that picket line, you're participating in a story that you think is justified, and that story then blinds you to the reality. It's, unless someone can come along and, and provide you a better story that's actually grounded in truth. If you make a good enough movie, if it's a really good movie, they will come. People are going, going to want it. If you make a Reservoir Dogs, a Pulp Fiction, something that's that, what and I, it yeah, stands, that's they're not going to, I honestly think that if you had some fire at that level, no one can stop you. No one can stop story. No one can stop a really good story. Mm. That is the only leverage you have in this industry. That is the ultimate leverage in this industry, is when you have fire. They will, if, if they, people want it, they'll take it. Like they, I don't think that the union, they're going to be able to blacklist you. And then the ability to re, reach an audience today, you could go elsewhere. There's other platforms. Even if, the, even if SAG were to be able to muddle your distribution to Hulu or what, you can, if, it's, if it's fire, it will find an audience. You can reach an audience. I know that for sure. But there is debate around how much the unions can interfere. Numbers don't lie. And this is also indicative of something else that's happening across not just narrative filmmaking and television. You have news. You have Pierce Morgan. Some say, he, oh, he got fired. But I think moving to YouTube, he, rep, he recognized a potential market as well. He recognizes that's the future. YouTube recently just surpassed trafficking of trafficking numbers. I think the demographic was under 25. But starting last year, they're getting more traffic, YouTube, than Netflix which there's a lot of competitors with Netflix. But I think I do believe that Netflix's biggest competitor is YouTube. Hulu's biggest competitor is not Netflix, it's, it's YouTube. Does it come down to the other? That's why we have people like Chris Gordon, Nerd Roddick, and Critical Drinker who are on YouTube, and that's why their channels get so many views. That is the audience speaking. So thank goodness for the competitive marketplace, because that is the only hope. Yeah, I mean, I know I might. Goodness for Daily Wire, who hopefully the audience will speak when they, if they can deliver Pendragon Cycle. If it's not Daily Wire, it will be something like that. Someone who says, we're not going to go union, whatever. <laughs> we don't care about what we go. We're going to go do our own thing. Let the marketplace decide. Hey! Hey! hey. Somebody want to okay. somebody wanna get me in touch with Warren Smith? <laughs> oh man no that's that's uh i, th I think i mean, that's 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 fine there enough of that video but uh that that's exactly what we've been saying for the past four years is there there are other ways in which people can watch movies that don't have to rely on the current studio system uh the current the current hollywood industry um you know and you youtube is 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 great um, but I think even you say it like it's with you, like starting out on YouTube now is almost impossible because yeah. you're playing to the algorithm and you're really just praying that you get a boost from the algorithm to be able to, to, 
to do that. Like, like right now I have 11,000 subscribers on my YouTube channel. There's nine people watching us, <laughs> right? <laughs> like that's a, it's yeah. a corrupt system. I, to be fair, I haven't went live on my YouTube channel yep. in a while, but, but, uh, you know, the, the, the subscriber counts don't matter anymore. The point is your subscriber counts don't yeah. determine your views. It's, it's, uh, whether or not the algorithm determines if your content is good for your subscribers. Yeah. You're out. The algorithm is the primary audience now is yeah. the, is the gatekeeper. Yeah. Yeah. And that's scary. That's scary for nerd Roddick and all those guys, uh, critical drinker, because if, if YouTube decides to shut their channels down, they're done. You know, like, you, yeah. right. And so, and, and, and so, you know, and, and, you know, and there's other people on YouTube that get punished by YouTube all the time. It's a Gundam is one. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I'm, I was just talking to somebody the other day about, uh, Jim can't swim, which did, uh, psychological breakdowns of interrogations from police interrogations. Guy had like 5 million subscribers. Every video he did got like 50 million views, 20 million views. And then YouTube just said, Hey, we're not going to monetize anything dealing with like violence anymore. <laughs> so you can't, <laughs> you know, and so he just quit, you know, he just quit. He just, he's like, well, you know, I'm a lawyer. I don't need this. And just quit, just quit. I mean, just like, just that sort of stuff is just, you know, um, where, where again, like the audience was there, uh, but the algorithm said no. Um, uh, and so, so that's a, that's a major, major concern too. Um, and, and I do wonder if people start going to YouTube outside of the permission of the unions, if the unions will come to YouTube and start punishing those people, um, that, you know, on there too. So the, I think the only solution to this really is complete free market uh funding of content directly and i think the lore obviously i'm biased towards the lore model where the artist uh pitches directly to the audience and you get the executives out of the way um and and then if the artists get funded they get funded and uh as as victor says here and that what he said uh is no no one can stop story <laughs> right so that's a great line, but we've been saying that it really is. all the time where it's like the story is really, re really the product at the end of the day. Um, and, and the numbers don't lie about that. So, uh, and the good thing about lore is we have all that data for what people want to see and are more than happy to share it with artists. So they know what kind of stuff the audience wants to make. Um, and so, you know, that's another. <laughs> am i back no nope. yeah you're back okay yeah right. so but, but but yeah so that's that's sort of uh really i like it's just trying to express to people how important this time is from especially from a venture perspective like what like everything has been teed up it was teed up for us like the first warning sign was in 2020 during during during, during the bug right? We, everything shut down. And so Hollywood was forced to use backlogs, right? And so uh, yep. then you had the writer's strike. And so then they didn't have a backlog anymore. So then you had a real problem with uh, content creation. And because, <laughs> because all the reality TV writers uh, or union, you can't even make reality television uh, to supplement you know, that, that happened in the first writer's strike. That's how we got yeah. reality TV. And now all the reality TV writers are union. Uh, and so so then they didn't even have that to go to. It was a complete shutdown. Um, and so, and, and during that time is really when we should have said, now is the time to strike. Now is the time to invest venture, to really build something completely and wholly unique. You know, I like, I like to say, you know, we, we have to build a new mountain and put a new name on it, right? Like, like not Hollywood anymore. It's a new mountain. Um, and, 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 and put that, put that new name on that. That sounded a little NAR, but I didn't mean, I didn't, I didn't mean it that way. I'm, I was referring to the, the Hollywood side, but, 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 but that's exactly, that's exactly what, what needs to happen. Like we need to start thinking we don't need that anymore. Like that doesn't need to exist anymore. 
And it's very hard to to understand that, especially if you're brought up in that system or if you've made a lot of your money through that system. Um, and, and, you know, it's hard to explain to people. Yeah, but that's not going to be 10 years from now. Hollywood is going to look completely different than it does now. And I think it's going to be a foundationally independent infrastructure um, that really takes off. Yep. I agree. We should be, <laughs> we should be working on it. <laughs> well, I think you said, you told me once, you said when, when everything went woke. Yeah. So there, there, there's three elements. There's, there's, there's COVID writer strike and woke, right? So those yeah. are the three assaults on Hollywood. And at each time, during those points, instead of saying, now we put our money in, now we build something, this is our time to strike, we just complained about what they were feeding us. Yeah. Um, and, 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 we, and we didn't build something um, and, and in response to it. And that's, uh, you know, a part of it is we believe that Hollywood was too big to fail. It's been around for 100 years. It'll never go away. Um, and I don't think people believe that anymore. Uh, yeah. But now it's the question of whether or not uh, they're willing to put up the risk to really challenge it. Um, and I think now's the time to do that. Yep. Yeah. And I think that we've been, we, we have been living in response as critics of Hollywood for so long that we didn't even know what to do when it started to fall apart. <laughs> you know, right, right. <laughs> like right. Goliath tripped and fell on his own sword. And we're like, D what do we do? Do we, we, we're not ready to charge the field. <laughs> <laughs> right. You chop off, you chop off his head. That's what you do. You chop his head. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you make sure you can't get back up again. Um, so, so, uh, yeah. So, so now's the time to strike. And, uh, I think, uh, I think that's pretty much all I have to say, but I just want to thank yeah. Warren Smith for that video. Um, yeah, that was fantastic. Uh, uh, and because uh, very rarely we don't get an economic perspective as to how unions work in any business. Um, but to see it done in Hollywood was, was really phenomenal. And, uh, but yeah. All right. Well, Hey guys, just by the way, you can get a free trial to lore TV. If you go to L O O R TV, subscribe, get a free, free seven day trial and start funding content. And, uh, We've been dropping content every week now. We got the whole series of Florida Lee now. We just launched the first journey into the world of Isaterra. And then we launched the whole series of What the Church. I think we're about to do season two of What the Church Do, right? Yep. Yep. And, yep. Got and then uh, subclass is about to go up. Hope. Can, can, I, can I tell you a funny story? Uh, yeah. Emilio who is the producer of what the church called me. And he said, Hey, I just want to let you know that it's not true. Uh, artists at Lord do get paid. <laughs> 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 and, and the money went in my bank account today. Uh, and, uh, and I was like, did you get all you asked for? Or did we, did we short you? And he said, that's what actually said. He said, I actually got paid more than what I asked for. Cause I wanted to donate the series to lore to help lore. But Jason told me that artists deserve to get paid. <laughs> right. And I was like, that is awesome. <laughs> I was just so encouraged by that. Cause it's absolutely, it's, it's, it's just, I was like, Oh man, this is a Christian company, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right. Like that, is, it was awesome. So anyway, I just, uh, you know, just let people know, like when you fund artists on lore, they get what they, they're, they, they're paid. And in most times Jason tells them they're not getting paid enough. Um, and they need to ask for more. Um, and so, so not that, and in breaking, yes. yeah, not every, yeah. So, yeah, you know, but breaking laws is in production now too. Um, yep. so, so that's excited about that one. today, I believe. Um, and so, uh, I think, uh, during, during the show, uh, Granda tagged us in some stuff. I'm looking forward to seeing some behind the scenes. Uh, so, yeah. so, so that, that show should be released soon. And, uh, and yeah, if you're interested in hearing more about lore and the economics of it and, uh, and uh, our accredited investor and looking to invest, I'd love to have a conversation with you and uh, let, a, let us walk you through the deck. So, uh, it, and uh, yeah, just share this video if you found it useful or insightful and, 
and uh, tell your friends about Lore. And by the way, one other thing, if you're already subscribed to Lore, there's a, if you go to your account settings, there's a custom referral link. And if you use that link to invite your friends and they sign up, you get more loot to spend than fund artists. So uh, very helpful tip there. Uh, and uh, you guys should take advantage of that as a means to look, start getting content funded even faster. So, all right, guys, thanks so much for watching. And, uh, and, we'll, and we'll, be, we'll be back again soon.